Uh, I'm going to expose some things about fluoride. Why have we been told we have fluoride in the drinking water? Prevent tooth decay. Prevent tooth decay. You were, were told that too, right? Yes. So was I. <laughs> what is fluoride? Why do we have it in the drinking water? You know, this one was really confusing to me because when I began to study fluoride and I found out how insidious the poison was, I couldn't imagine how scientists in their right mind or even in their wrong mind could even figure out why you would put fluoride in the drinking water. This is published by the American Dental Association. All right? And the title of this is Fluoride Helps Prevent Tooth Decay. Today, more than 120 million people, representing over 50% of the population, are served by fluoridated water supplies in the United States. 50% of the people in the United States have fluoridated water in their water supplies. Congratulations, they've done a good job. I want to find out what fluoride really is. So, I am going to go to resources. How about medical physiology? It's a book that all dentists have in their library. Fluoride is also a natural component of tooth enamel and bone. In other words, fluoride is something that's necessary. It's part of metabolism, right? Fluoride does not seem to be a necessary element for metabolism. Hmm. Well, fluoride helps teeth become more resilient to decay by strengthening tooth enamel. <laughs> Fluoride does not make the teeth themselves stronger. <laughs> there is also evidence that fluoride strengthens the bones and thus may help to prevent such degenerative diseases as osteoporosis. Has nothing to do with uh, teeth, but osteoporosis. Excessive intake of fluorine causes fluorosis, which is manifest in the mild state by mottled teeth and in a more severe state by enlarged bones. As a medical journalist, I just can't accept that. I mean, there's too many things that are too far off the wall. I've got to go to another source. How about the Townsend Newsletter, May 1990? Just recent information. This is a letter from doctors communicating with doctors. All right. The National Toxology Program, now that sounds pretty good, study fact sheet dated January 22nd, 1990, recent. Uh, under the auspices of the United States Public Health Service, good, has linked fluoride to fluorosis and cancer. Hmm. 1985 Procter and Gamble report. They've got a vested interest in this. Obtained October 4th, 1989, from the Department of Health and Human Services, also links fluoride to cancer. Hmm. John R. Lee medical doctor says the strength of the fluoride cancer link is greater than that which resulted in the banning of all our red dye number three or cyclamate. David Kennedy, DDS, San Diego, California, says fluorides do not reduce tooth decay. Is he the only one? Dr. Hardwick and DM Bunting of Turner Dental School says the changes in the number of lesions or cavities were not significant in one or two parts per million of fluoride supplementation. Why do we have fluoride in the water if it isn't working? Canada, the, the areas which report the lowest incidence in decay are the unfluoridated areas. I'm beginning to smell a rat. Over tooth decay. Procter & Gamble announces Crest Toothpaste with Floristan, its exclusive fluoride compound, world's greatest weapon against decay. Look, Mom, no cavity. Former employees of Occidental Chemical Corporation have filed a lawsuit against the company. They say they have life-threatening diseases like leukemia, emphysema, and toxic brain syndrome. For years, doctors struggled to diagnose them, but finally they found a common link. It was fluoride. It's a byproduct that they can't do anything with. It's a poison, so they sell it. You allow industry to use your water supply to dispose of their hazardous waste. It was a scam from the get-go. It is a means of getting rid of fluoride. It's a disposal mechanism. It's bizarre. Fluoridation is the worst recycling practice in the world. So, you're Alcoa in the 1930s, a giant corporation that makes products out of aluminum. 
And honestly, you've created some pretty amazing things. Tea kettles, foil, airplane parts. But one thing that sucks about manufacturing aluminum is that it's a super messy process. Because guess what? Raw aluminum doesn't come all perfect and soft and ready to be molded into a frying pan. It needs to be chemically processed and broken down. And this chemical process produces a lot of highly toxic chemicals like ammonia, methane, and fluoride. And we're not talking about the natural fluoride that occurs in caves and stuff. We're talking about an artificial man-made fluoride compound that is way more toxic, like really, really toxic. Hydrofluorosic acid does not occur in nature. It's a man-made molecule. And it eats through concrete, glass, stainless steel, fiberglass, plastic. You name it, it'll eat it. The problem is, it would be super expensive to dispose of this toxic fluoride in a safe and responsible way. So, it's a 1930s factory owner to do. Hmm. Why not pipe it into the air or, or dump it in the river? I mean, come on, it's the 1930s. This is the dawn of the industrial age. No one cares that factories are dumping toxic chemicals into the river. No one even knows what the long-term effects of these industrial waste chemicals are. They're too busy making up for prohibition or whatever people did in the 30s. So as the years went by, you continued to flood the rivers with this fluoride waste. And everything was going fine and dandy for decades until things started to go south. See, you've been dumping fluoride into the air and water for over 30 years now, and people were starting to notice. Alcoa factory workers were showing symptoms of poisoning from the fluoride gases. Cows from nearby farms were getting really weak. They couldn't even stand on their own anymore. And local dentists were starting to notice strange brown stains and chipping on the teeth of children who live nearby. Fluoride is starting to get bad press. And if that bad press continued, everyone would start connecting the dots to you and your fluoride river dumping frenzy. And if that happens, you're gonna be buried with expensive lawsuits. It would be the end of you. So if you wanna survive this and thrive, then you gotta do something drastic. You gotta find a way to change the public's perception of fluoride from this toxic poisonous chemical to something that's good for you. And this, this effort to rebrand fluoride into a healthy chemical would be one of the greatest propaganda efforts known to mankind. It's why today, fluoride has seeped into everything. It's in your toothpaste. Chemical? You're gonna put some chemical in my mouth? Tap water, table salt, bottled water. Yes, Crest can really reduce cavities because only Crest has Fluoristan, an exclusive Stannis fluoride formula that protects your whole family chemical leak this afternoon in Rock Island. The chemical was so strong that it was burning through the concrete there. It was just before one o'clock Thursday afternoon when hazmat crews were called to the Rock Island water treatment plant for a chemical spill coming from this tanker truck. The chemical hydrofluorosicilic acid is used to add fluoride to the plant's water. After several hours, crews were able to clean up the leak, allowing operations to return to normal. Uh, the treatment of the water and the, the amount of water uh, you know, being used by the public, there's no effect on that at all. So why are we putting that in the water? The United States, Canada, Australia, Ireland, and New Zealand generously provide you with the fluoride in your tap water free of charge. Why? Because it's good for you, they say. It's good for teeth. It prevents cavities. To say things like tobacco is harmless, fluoride is harmless. Agent Orange is harmless, they say. DDT was harmless. Asbestos, right? Yeah, GMOs now, they say, are harmless. There's a long history of science selling out to corporate interests while the people are systematically poisoned. And to this day, people still believe fluoride is safe in the drinking water, and the majority of dentists still believe it's safe to put in toothpaste and to put in different types of compounds. When in reality, too much fluoride has been connected to brain damage, skeletal fluorosis, bone cancer, and lower IQ in children. What we did was we exposed them, let them drink the fluoride in the water for six to 20 weeks. The pattern that we saw, it typically is what we see with other neurotoxic agents that are well known to cause a hypoactivity or uh, a memory problem or an IQ problem. When I first presented the results of these studies, one of the 
individual sitting and listening to the results. He says, do you have any idea what you're saying? And he says, you're telling us that we're reducing the IQ of children. And yet, the government won't let you escape it even if you wanted to. It's a city. It'll kill you. And it all started because Alcoa didn't want to get sued. Welcome to Evil Food Supply, where we expose all the evils of our modern diet. Subscribe for more, and this is the evil history of fluoride. If it's such a simple issue, how is it that it's still going on after half a century? Fluoride is safe and effective, and it's one of the most inexpensive ways to really cut down on dental decay. Fluoridation of community water is extremely safe and extremely effective in preventing tooth decay. Science is on the side of fluoride being safe and effective. There is no controversy about this in the scientific community. The newest beer can tops have ring tabs made of aluminum from Alcoa. Now beer can. All of the music and sound effects you hear in this video came from Epidemic Sound. Epidemic Sound is this incredible, royalty-free music and sound effects platform where you can download unlimited music and sound effects for your videos. They've got over 35,000 tracks and 90,000 sound effects for you to choose from. And they're the only place we get music from. And finding the perfect song for your content is super easy. You can filter by specific genres like cartoon music or crime scene music or even pop music from the 2000s. You can get that specific. And it's the same thing with sound effects too. Music and sound effects are the easiest way to make your videos feel way more high quality. And Epidemic Sound has the best selection. Pause the video and try it out now with the link in the video description. That's Epidemic Sound with the link below. America prepares. All America alters its pattern of life and work to meet the demand for protection. Industry is a double step to supply the sinews of safety. The armaments of war that an embattled world must have if democracy is to survive. In the early 1940s, the US launched a little something called the Manhattan Project. But to make an atomic bomb, the US would need uranium and fluoride. But not just a little bit of fluoride, we're talking tons of fluoride. Hundreds of tons, actually. Luckily, the U.S. knew just the affordable place to get all this fluoride from. American manufacturing factories like yours. As the head of Alcoa, you're all in, obviously. So you sign on the dotted line, turn your engines to max, and start producing as much fluoride as you possibly can. And other factories across America do the same. And at first, this seemed like a really good idea. I mean, hello, this is the stuff you would normally dump in the river, and now you're getting money for it? Plus, Uncle Sam needs us. America needs us. We're being patriots. But shortly into your war effort, things start to go downhill. The toxic gases from all this fluoride production was making your factory workers sick, sometimes even killing them. Chemical burns were showing up all over their bodies, including their eyes, throats, and esophagus. Fair-skinned men were leaving the factory with burnt red faces, which is why you made sure to only employ African Americans inside. Constant gas leaks and explosions would literally burn workers to death. One woman named Gloria Porter said that she saw a man get, quote, eaten alive end quote, when a tank of hydrogen fluoride gas exploded in a factory in Cleveland. Another man reported that the fluoride dust would land on cars outside and dissolve the paint on contact. And even though they were working with highly toxic chemicals, all you gave these factory workers for safety equipment was a rag to put over their mouths. You gotta love the industrial age. Between June 1945 and October 1946, 
477 factory workers were either injured or died from chemical-related accidents in these fluoride factories. And word was getting out. These factory workers lost their lives because of the poor working conditions you set up. Their families could sue you. In fact, they're probably talking to lawyers as we speak. And if they do sue you, your whole business and your life's work could go down the toilet. But luckily, there's one convenient benefit to fluoride that you can use to turn all this fluoride panic around. Okay. Ida's a decay fighter dentist use. A decay fighter dentist put on teeth to prevent cavities. There's no such thing. Preventive medicine for teeth? For fewer cavities? Can't be done. It has. Now Gleam's done it. New Gleam's put preventive medicine in a toothpaste for fewer cavities. Medicine. It's Stannis Fluoride plus Stannis Pyrophosphate. Gleam tastes great. No toothpaste fights cavities better. Preventive medicine for fewer cavities in new Gleam. I said it could be done. Back in 1901, a scientist named Frederick McKay started noticing a strange brown staining on his patient's teeth. This brown staining came out of nowhere and was only happening in his town. No other towns in the area had it. And this was pretty weird. So Frederick did some investigating and discovered that the tap water in his Colorado town had absurdly high levels of fluoride in it. I wonder how that happened. His patients were walking in with these ugly brown stains, but they also had no cavities and rock hard teeth. And this wasn't a typical thing at the time. In the early 1900s, tooth decay was a really big problem. Teenagers were getting fitted for dentures. Soldiers were failing their health exams. There was even a lucrative black market for false teeth. But this fluoride thing, this fluoride thing was great for making your teeth stronger. It prevented cavities. Now that is something that we can work with. Now all you have to do is propagate this message to the masses. You know, honey, I think it just could be the crest. Of the five leading toothpastes, only one has fluoride. Only crest, the cavity fighter. The great thing about this fluoride disaster is that you're not fighting this alone. The government also had their head on the chopping block for encouraging factories to pump out even more fluoride. So you and the government were on the same side. And with the government in your corner, anything was possible. So here's what you did. First, you hunted down that dentist, Frederick McKay, the guy who discovered that fluoride hardens teeth. And then you use his research to back your case. And you even give him better technology so he can finish his study faster. Might as well support the guy, right? And then you present his study to cities all over America, saying that if these cities added fluoride to their tap water, it would prevent cavities. And guess what? They drank it up. Wanting to put a random chemical into everyone's water supply may sound crazy today from our point of view, but remember, this was around the end of World War II. Americans had just defeated Hitler. They defeated Japan. They saved the world. And after winning such a vicious war, back home, they naturally became overprotective. They wanted to protect the masses from everything, to prevent bad stuff from happening ever again. So adding fluoride into the water supply to protect people's teeth? Why not? We can't trust them to take care of themselves. So it was no surprise that in 1945, Grand Rapids, Michigan, signed up to be the first trial city, the first city in the world to have fluoridated water. And after just six years, you found out that the fluoride actually worked. Tooth decay did in fact go down. Pretty soon, other cities start getting excited about fluoridation. Because who doesn't want clean, white, shiny teeth? Fluoride was successfully a positive thing right in front of your eyes. However, the true genius of this master plan was that the more cities you get to dump fluoride in their water, the less of a chance you'll get sued. 
After all, fluoride is good for you. We've actually been doing America a favor. And when scientists come forward and question you on the safety of fluoride, like Kai Roholm and later on, Frederick McKay himself, you simply pump out more studies that refute them. You open a lab at the University of Rochester that's dedicated to the study of fluoride, and you fill it with the researchers from the Manhattan Project, just to keep it in the family. You even start your own academic journal on tooth decay called Dental Caries and make fluoride the star. The naysayers were no match for your expert propaganda. And by 1955, Crest releases a new product that would be the last nail in the coffin for fluoride's new positive public image. Crest toothpaste with Floristan, its exclusive fluoride compound that's far superior to fluoride alone. The world's first fluoride toothpaste. And they actually started working with the fluoride and did the original toxicology studies. And they described what happened to some of these people when they were accidentally overexposed to fluoride. <laughs> Mandrake, have you never wondered why I drink only distilled water or rainwater? By the 1970s, fluoride had become a beloved household name. And sure, there were a few fringe conspiracy theorists who would say that fluoridation is part of a communist plot to turn us into brain-dead atheist slaves, but luckily, you have almost every dentist in America to back up your fluoride claims. I mean, it does prevent dental decay, doesn't it? And do we really want to go back to wearing dentures made from donkey teeth? Ew, no. Of course not. So pretty much everyone in America was on Team Fluoride. But you're still not totally in the clear, because there's one little scientist, one little rat, who's doing everything she can to dismantle your fluoride lies. And her name was Phyllis Mullenix. Dr. Phyllis Mullenix started her career at the University of Kansas with a PhD in pharmacology with a specialty in neurotoxicology. It was 1982 and Phyllis had just started her new job at the Forsyth Dental Center in Boston. Her mission? Testing the toxicity levels of different chemicals, including fluoride. And so, she went through the usual motions. She fed fluoride-laced water to rats and observed their behavior. And what she saw was kinda terrifying. The pregnant rats who were fed fluoridated water were giving birth to hyperactive babies. They were also mentally slower than the rats whose mothers weren't fed the water. Phyllis also noted that male rats were more easily affected by fluoride in the womb, whereas females were more affected when they drank the water later as young adults. And what's interesting about this study is that it aligns with another study that was published in Canada in 2019 where the male babies of human mothers that drank fluoridated water showed signs of a lowered IQ and hyperactivity, while the females did not. There was no question that behavior was vulnerable to fluoride. Whether you got a very short exposure, and this in animals, if, you, if, you're, if they're young, if it's prenatal, or if it's early postnatal, all you needed was two or three days exposure to this and it caused a permanent change in behavior when the animals grew up. Phyllis got pretty excited about this, so excited that she typed out a whole paper and submitted it to the Journal of Neurotoxicology and Teratology. What she didn't know was that she was being watched by none other than Harold Hodge, the head researcher of the Manhattan Project. Yeah, he was still alive at the time, and Hodge was really not happy about this nonsense on the toxicity of fluoride. Sure, he was super old now, but he still didn't want anything to ruin the sparkling clean image of fluoride that he worked tirelessly to build. Plus, if people find out that fluoride really was toxic, then he would definitely get sued or go to jail. And so would all the other companies who poisoned those workers during the days of the Manhattan Project. To top all this off, the dental center also didn't want this paper published because they're being funded by pro-fluoride organizations, and that would be a huge conflict of interest. So yeah, this meddling lady needs to go. 
So what do you do? You corner the rat and threaten to fire her if she publishes the paper. And what did Phyllis do in response? She published it anyway. After Phyllis turned in her lab coat, she found out the truth on who this Hodge guy really was and why he was always hovering over her experiments at the dental center. It can reduce decay, and 5,000 kids like these help prove it. No toothpaste fights cavities better than new gleam. And gleam tastes good. What do you know about fluoride in the water? Um, it, it's, it's in the water to prevent tooth decay. It's a good thing, Rhett. That's what they want you to believe. Of, dude, the fact that you can't drink water out of a river anywhere. Stop right there. You know what? Fluoride protects your teeth and is perfectly healthy for you. Well, if Jam says that, then he is a lying idiot. And if you believe it, then so are you. Fast forward to today, and fluoride is still a really big household name. And anyone who questions it is instantly labeled as a conspiracy theorist of Alex Jones' standards. <laughs> and anyone who brings up fluoride to Congress gets questioned. You cited several studies, um, which were very interesting. I, are these are these basically uh, independent studies with no peer review or have the, has there been sufficient peer review uh, to give these, these studies more credibility or not? But the reality is fluoride is a double-edged sword. On one side, it is a miracle for your teeth, but on the other hand, too much of it can cause a whole bunch of disorders and diseases. And the scientific community has been fighting over this for decades. Phyllis's study was criticized for using too much fluoride in her water at five parts per million, whereas the US government's recommendation at the time was one part per million. But think about this. Just because you mix fluoride into the water supply at one parts per million doesn't mean that's what people are actually consuming. What about all the food products that are made with fluoridated water? Raisins contain fluoride at 2.34 parts per million. Wine at 2.02 parts per million, and black tea at 3.73. Is that when I drank a Coke, when I drank Snapple tea, when I drank grape juice, that I was really adding to my body burden of uh, fluoride with all these others. The American people, and especially our children, are getting way too much fluoride. Two thirds of children living in fluoridated communities have dental fluorosis in at least one tooth. Dental fluorosis is the visible manifestation of toxic overexposure to fluoride during their developmental years. And let's not forget the undisclosed dumping of fluoride by factories into the water and air. So that one parts per million turns to two parts, three parts, four parts pretty fast. With fluoridated water at 4 ppm being found to cause bone fractures and skeletal fluorosis in children. It all depends on how much fluoride you actually consume, not how much the government dumps in the water supply, which is next to impossible for the average person to calculate. And I'm sure you're wondering, why aren't we all passing out from fluoride poisoning every time we brush our teeth or drink a glass of water? Well, it's because we're consuming fluoride in super small doses, like a poison drip. And every time we drink it, our system filters some of it out, but not all of it. One study showed that only 50% of fluoride gets filtered out of the body. So where does the rest go? It gets absorbed into your bones. And according to Phyllis, it also absorbs into your brain, one drop at a time. Great! Great fight cavities, so I'm gonna fight And fluoride is far from the only questionable thing in our modern diet. becoming widely known to dentists and municipal authorities since tooth decay. The children in Grand Rapids have less tooth decay than they did six years ago, as much as 65% less. Grand Rapids' fight against tooth decay
started in January 1945 when fluoride was added to the water supply. This was done as part of a study to determine the effect of fluoridation on tooth decay. Participating in the study are city officials, dentists, Michigan State Department of Health, University of Michigan, and the U.S. Public Health Service. After six years of fluoridation, the study shows that the six-year-old children who drank the water from birth had 65% less tooth decay. The seven-year-olds, 45% less, and so on. Even the 16-year-olds who started drinking the water when they were 10 years old received some benefits, 16% less tooth decay. 16 years after fluoridation, all children, 16 years old and under, will have 65% less tooth decay. Studies in Newburgh, New York, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, Marshall, Texas, Lewiston, Idaho, Brantford, Ontario, and other cities show substantially the same results as those obtained at Grand Rapids. Other studies show the benefits of fluoridation will last throughout life. Most of the many communities now fluoridating add sodium silica fluoride or sodium fluoride to their water. Another compound also used is hydrofluorosilicic acid. All three are effective and cheap. In a town of 5,000 population, the daily amount of the fluoride compound used and its cost is Sodium silica fluoride, 7 pounds, cost, 49 cents. Sodium fluoride, 10 pounds, cost, $1.20. Hydrofluorosilicic acid, about 2 gallons, $1.61. In selecting one of the three compounds, the size of the town and its water plant facilities are considered. Three types of feeders are used to add fluoride compounds. One is the solution feeder, used in towns up to about 20,000 population. Another type is the volumetric feeder, a dry feeder for towns of from 1,000 to 120,000. The third type is the gravimetric feeder, for feeding the dry compound in cities of more than 120,000. All three feeders, the solution feeder, the volumetric feeder, and the gravimetric, are equipped with automatic controls and have long been used for adding chemicals to city water supplies. Generally, the fluoride content of the water is determined by the colorimetric test. In this test, a color indicator is added to water samples the color of the samples is then matched with the color of standards containing known amounts of fluoride. Dentists in many cities are helping to bring the benefits of fluoridation to children. Now, our children can have better health through fluoridated water. They can drink away tomorrow's tooth decay have more attractive teeth. The cost is about 10 cents a year per person. Fluoridation is endorsed by the American Dental Association, State and Territorial Dental Health Directors, American Association of Public Health Dentists, Public Health Service, Federal Security Agency, State and Territorial Health Officers, American Public Health Association, and the American Medical Association. Now, Dr. Burke, uh, your research shows that uh, if all of the United States had been fluoridated, it would mean uh, about 70,000 extra deaths because of cancer per annum. 
Those are remarkable, impressive, and in fact, rather disquieting figures. Could you shortly describe your research in this field and what results did you get from it? Yes. The 70,000, of course, represents, would represent one-fifth of all the cancer deaths in the United States, twice as many from breast cancer in women and twice as many as from lung cancer in man. Uh, to our studies involve comparing the deaths of all persons in the 10 largest fluoridated cities of the United States with the 10 largest non-fluoridated cities in the United States year by year. And we obtained a very remarkable curve, which you can see here perhaps. Here is the fluoridated, and here is the non-fluoridated set of 10 cities each. Before, here's where the fluoridation started. And before this time, both sets of cities were identical. But no sooner had fluoridation started than this curve began to go up, the deaths began to increase, so that this effect occurs very promptly within one, two, or five years. Now this, sir, is conclusive evidence that fluor kills because of cancer. It is one of the most conclusive bits of scientific and biological evidence that I have come across in my 50 years in the field of cancer research. Would this then, in your opinion, be the end of fluor in water, in drinking water? It should be the end, and in the United States, it should so be the end by federal law known as the Delaney Amendment, which says that anything found to induce cancer in man or animals cannot be legally put into the food or drink of man or animals. And so, uh, and this is all less than one year old, so that it entirely changes any previous ideas of fluoridation that anyone may have had, because this is the first real indication of an important effect. Now, in, uh, in, in this country, of course, the state of the, uh, the dental state of the Union, the way people's teeth look, is incredible indeed. Would you say that uh, stopping fluor had other effects than increasing the dental problems in this country? Well, I would rather look at it that it would certainly help the cancer death situation in this country which I'm sure most people would agree is far more important than a temporary benefit to teeth in adolescent children. Now this, uh, this, this, you see, amounts to public murder on a grand scale. It is a public crime, it would be, to put fluoride in the drinking water of people. Now the children of this cameraman and mine, sir, take fluor. Should we stop this immediately? Well, in my opinion, if they were my children, uh, they would not take it anymore. I can only recommend for myself, but I would suggest to you that they stop it. Is there a difference uh, in having fluor in drinking water or administering little fluor pills to children? Well, of course, the little fluor pills are a much smaller proposition than drinking gallons of water per day or per week, as well as taking a bath in it and washing your automobile in it and watering your lawns. That's a very massive thing compared to uh, brushing teeth with fluoridated toothpaste. Yes. But uh, our work is immediately concerned with drinking water. What happens to toothpaste, I'm quite willing to uh, let the future studies go into that in more detail. There is, of course, you talk about murder, sir, an ethical aspect to all this, a law aspect, an aspect of people's inhumanity to people. What is your uh, idea about how should this be implemented in our society? The ethical aspects of administering poison, as it were, to people. Well, I think this aspect, this murder aspect, uh, clearly indicates 
a very strong unethical aspect to forcing people to kill themselves. Personally, ain't none in there at all. Jiggle the molecules. Sometimes the fluoride gets jammed down between the spray paint particles. Uh, Mr. Halen, come on. Mm, all right, damn it. I'm going to tackle this issue head on. The first widespread commercial use of fluoride was for the eradication of vermin. Since the 1800s, sodium fluoride has been a key ingredient in rat poison and insecticides. These products were commonly used in and around the home to kill lice, mice, rats, and insects. Fluoride proved to be not only a good way to kill rodents, but also an effective way to kill a man. As the use of fluoride became more popular, reports began flooding in of people dying from ingesting this toxic substance. Headlines screamed. Roach poisoned in pancakes kills 11 men. Rancher takes dose of poison by mistake. Article after article, all having the same tragic endings, proving that sodium fluoride can and does indeed cause death. In fact, during the last part of the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution was taking hold of the modern world. An unfortunate byproduct of this technological revolution was that it created the most toxic pollutants known to man. And the most hazardous and destructive of them all was fluoride. In his award-winning book, The Fluoride Deception, investigative journalist Christopher Bryson examines fluoride's disturbing history. Bryson notes that in its early days, fluoride was a widely known and well-documented killer. Documentation from early lawsuits against fluoride manufacturers clearly shows that fluoride was a hazard, not only to humans, but to the environment as well, with damages reaching into the tens of millions of dollars. By 1930, the aluminum industry was the largest and most influential fluoride polluter. Industrial giants such as Alcoa knew they had to do something. Vegetation and livestock near Alcoa plants were being decimated as toxic fluoride fumes lingered, rendering nearby cattle lame and crippled, even causing death. One newspaper article from that time proclaimed, During the past year, we had 51 head of cattle die. We had laboratory tests made, and these tests show excessive amounts of fluorine in the liver and kidneys. Also, some of our young cows had lost their teeth. Our saddle horses were so crippled from fluorine poisoning, they had to be shot. The serious nature of fluoride toxicity was beginning to be realized. As a result, fluoride's threat to corporate America was laid out in an exhaustive review conducted by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Toxicologist Floyd Dietz warned of new medical information exposing fluoride's harmful effects. Danish scientist Kaj Roholm singled out the aluminum industry, specifically Alcoa, as the source of much of the fluoride poisoning. Fluoride was causing irreparable damage, and the word was getting out. Alcoa knew they had to act fast. Their high-powered attorneys sprung into action, quickly buying up farms and paying out settlements. Ironically enough, during that time, the U.S. Public Health Service was under the jurisdiction of the United States Treasury Secretary, Andrew W. Mellon. Mellon was the founder and major stockholder of Alcoa. He was also the founder of the Mellon Institute, an industry-funded research institute that was notorious for giving corporations, such as Alcoa, the scientific data they needed to defend themselves against lawsuits. The Mellon Institute published questionable and self-serving evidence that supported the effectiveness of fluoride in fighting tooth decay. In doing so, the Mellon Institute rats had put a smiling face on what had been a scientifically recognized environmental and workplace poison. It was an aluminum industry-funded scientist, Dr. Gerald Cox, who worked at the Mellon Institute, that first made the proposal to artificially fluoridate public water supplies. Mellon's economic interest in fluoridation was obvious. Fluoridation provided the chemical industry an opportunity to void liability of their poisonous fluoride waste by means of promoting it as a health benefit. The official human experiments began in Grand Rapids, Michigan on January 25, 1945. 107 barrels of sodium fluoride were delivered to Grand Rapids, where city technicians began tipping them into the city's water supply. They were the first to publicly fluoridate their water. It was to serve as the test city, and its tooth decay rates were to be compared with those of non-fluoridated Muskegon. The study only lasted five years, 
There are no permanent teeth in a child born at the beginning of the study. It was an unblinded study. They did no measure of safety, and they claimed that there was a tremendous benefit to the permanent teeth. Well, there weren't any permanent teeth in the children that were born at the beginning of the study. And soon thereafter, they fluoridated Muskegon, the control city. It's a phony baloney study used to demonstrate the benefits where there are none. Unfortunately, fluoride's ugly side has almost entirely escaped the public view. As Bryson points out, historians have failed to record that fluoride pollution was in fact the biggest legal worry of the industries that were involved in developing the atomic bomb program. As some may remember, the Manhattan Project was a secret program which brought the atomic bomb into existence. But what most people are totally unaware of is the fact that fluoride was an essential element in the production of the atom bomb. It was a guy named Harold Hodge that was the chief toxicologist for the Manhattan Project. And basically, in order to create the nuclear weapons, they needed massive, massive amounts of fluoride. He was hired as a toxicologist or part of the team to determine is there going to be any toxic effects of fluoride in this project. Really, what they were worried about is they were worried about lawsuits. They knew that there was negative effects of fluoride. They had to basically invent this whole scheme so they could use the high levels of fluoride in the Manhattan Project to create atomic and nuclear weapons. For more than 70 years, the Public Health Service has assured society that fluoridation is safe and effective. These assurances have largely rested on the results of the 1945 Newburgh Kingston Fluoride Carries Trial. This study compared the safety of fluoride in drinking water for two New York cities, one fluoridated, the other not fluoridated. The impetus for the first fluoridated city, Grand Rapids, was born from this study. However, recently declassified documents show that this study was a complete fabrication. A trail of declassified Manhattan Project papers unearthed by investigative journalist Christopher Bryson show that the toxicology department at the University of Rochester, which was under the direction of Harold Hodge, secretly monitored the Newburgh experiment to, quote, supply evidence useful in the litigation arising from an alleged loss of a fruit crop. In fact, these once restricted documents reveal that as far back as 1944, the Manhattan Project was spending money on toxicology studies on fluoride. Why? because fluoride was the key ingredient used in the process of enriching uranium. Enriched uranium was the linchpin of the U.S. military's fledgling nuclear weapons program. Fluoride became a national security issue. The declassified documents suggest that Newburgh was simply another human experiment, one used to justify the interests and advancement of the nuclear industrial state. The final report of Newburgh concluded that small concentrations of fluoride were safe. Yet documents revealed that the top fluoride scientist in the U.S., Dr. H. Trendley Dean, known as the father of fluoridation, secretly opposed the experiment, fearing that fluoride's toxicity would be revealed. Until now, Dean's dissent on Newburgh has never been made public. There's irrefutable evidence that the U.S. military the Manhattan Project, the makers of the atomic bomb, concealed evidence of fluoride's harm to their workers, to the community, and to the American public. One study was published in the journal of the American Dental Association in 1948 by Dale. In these files, Manhattan Project Captain Peter Dale at the University of Rochester reported preliminary results of dental investigations among laboratory fluoride workers at Columbia University. He concluded that fluoride did not prevent cavities in the 95 laboratory workers examined. Quote, their teeth seemed to be deteriorating rapidly and their gums bled more freely. In fact, most of the hydrofluoric acid workers examined had few or no teeth left. They were in large part toothless or nearly toothless. This information, however, was left out of the published version. The published study merely notes that the fluoride workers had fewer cavities than did the unexposed workers. They didn't mention the fact that they had fewer cavities because their teeth had fallen out of their mouths. Since World War II, fluoride has been one of the most destructive environmental pollutants. At one point during the Cold War, fluoride was blamed for more damage claims against industry than all 20 other major air pollutants combined. Fluoride was responsible for one of the most notorious environmental disasters in U.S. history, 
the town of Donora, Pennsylvania, which jump-started the environmental movement. In 1948, the small mill town lost 20 people, and an estimated 6,000 men, women, and children were sickened by U.S. Steel's dark blanketing smog. Even the town's name betrayed its corporate roots. Donora was an amalgam of the first name of Nora Mellon, the wife of industrialist Andrew W. Mellon. After the Halloween disaster in Donora, Pennsylvania, Philip Stadler, a chemist, went to Donora, and he was able to test and measure and prove that it was fluoride that had caused all those deaths. Sadler quickly went public. Article after article ran the story. Chemist says fluorine gas caused 19 smog deaths. Sadler said, chronic fluorine poisoning has been killing people in Donora for a long time. It has left its characteristic trademark on the valley's animals, crops, and vegetation. Both the U.S. Army and the Atomic Energy Commission, now known as the Energy Department, had a secret and vital interest in the outcome of the Donora disaster. If fluoride were fingered for the Donora deaths, it might bring unwanted scrutiny of worker health safety for those in the bomb factories, resulting in damage suits and expensive requirements for air pollution controls. On October 1949, the Public Health Service official report on Donora was released. The 173-page government document appeared to be of similar size to that of the Holy Bible and came to virtually no conclusions. The report's emphasis was on bad weather and that the disaster was therefore an act of God. The report made no mention of fluoride. Could it be there was a vested interest on the part of the government not to upset the public concerning the potential dangers of fluoride? Although it was Gerald Cox's idea that ultimately led to the endorsement of water fluoridation, the man who gave the official endorsement was Federal Security Administrator Oscar R. Ewing, Alcoa's top Wall Street attorney. Nine months after the Donora disaster, Ewing made a surprise announcement for the nation. The U.S. Public Health Service was reversing a long-held position. The ex-Alcoa lawyer declared that his agency now favored adding fluoride to drinking water across the United States. Coincidence? When it came time to choose a public relations representative to persuade public opinion in favor of water fluoridation, Ewing chose none other than the father of public relations himself, Edward Bernays. When they're selling water fluoridation, they didn't just walk out and say it's good for you. They actually hired Edward Bernays, Sigmund Freud's nephew, to sell Americans on how good it was to have silicone fluoride in the water. Edward Bernays was the one that created how to control the population through media and through advertising. Edward Bernays, also known as the father of spin, pioneered the idea of crowd psychology. In 1928, he wrote a book called Propaganda, in which he wrote, If we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, is it not possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without their knowing it? He called it the engineering of consent. Bernays introduced the corporate giants to crowd psychology methods and polished techniques to manipulate society. He convinced the population to buy on impulse things they didn't even need. In his writings, he concluded that individuals were controlled by four basic motivations, self-preservation, aggression, security, and sex. Bernays' belief was that by appealing to any of these four motives, it was possible to manipulate the majority of a population into doing almost anything. You could brainwash them into smoking cigarettes, starting war, electing politicians, you name it. And given the proven effectiveness of these techniques, it was no coincidence that the Aluminum Company of America asked Bernays to head the campaign for the fluoridation of the United States water supply. New research from China supports Dr. Mullenex's conclusion that fluoride affects mental development and IQ levels. I've heard a great deal about a chemical that can be used on the teeth to help prevent decay. Is that a good thing to use? It certainly is. We use a fluoride solution, and we have evidence that for some people... Fifty years ago, American government scientists had clinical evidence that fluoride affected the central nervous system. But all this was kept secret. Chemical. You're gonna put some chemical in my mouth. Hey, mama, what's that fluoride in my water? Hey, mama, what's that fluoride in my bowl? Hey, mama, won't you tell Mr. Fluoride to leave my clean, clear water alone? Oh, it's a neurotoxin.
toxin and it's a toxic waste if it belonged in your body you could eat your toothpaste it's not Monstrously conceived and dangerous communist plot we have ever had to face. I told you so. I told you. I told you so. I told you. Remember when I 
told you about 9-11 yeah. Remember when I told you about Building 7 yeah. Remember when I told you about the fluoride in the water Yes I did Remember when I told you about the new world order Remember that Remember when I told you about the chemtrails in the sky Remember when I told you that NASA was full of lies Remember when I told you about the ultra mind control Well I just wanna say that I told you so, yeah Remember when I told you about 432 Hurts that is And what Fall 40 can do to you It hurts my ears Remember when I told you about the vaccine agenda Yes I did And that Michelle Obama is a transgender Yes she is the dinosaur fraud, the climate change scam, and yes, Sandra Bullock is also a man. Remember when I told you that there ain't no clue? Well, I just want to say that I told you so. 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 I told you so.